Yeah, welcome to the south. It's warm here. <laughs> yeah, it's like we just shoveled five inches of global warming off our front Is your line out working, Rebecca? Your line out working? Uh, I don't think I need a mic unless you need it for the recording. It would be great for the recording. Okay. Yeah. All right. Are you, yes. Are you going through your directional mic too? Or not? The shotgun mic looks pretty good. Is that, I mean, if you, is this good? Because. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then I don't have to stand on the stage. You don't have to stand on the stage, I can, right. I can, I can be right here and grab everybody. Compost your enemies. I love that. We, we uh, you know, we we have huge compost piles that we compost. Yeah, I've seen them. I've seen your videos. Water. Yeah. Even if a cow dies, you know, you throw it in there. Compost pile. Did the bones? Do the bones get composted? No, the bones don't. But but they just go out on the field and and I mean it's calcium. The grass grows up around them, and then you know two or three years they you know. What about the critters getting into your compost pile? No, um, so the key to the compost pile, A, wood chips, because they won't bridge. In other words, nothing can dig into them and tunnel because the, cause the, the chips keep falling down into the tunnel. Whereas if you use hay, straw, sawdust, you can tunnel through it because it'll, it'll bridge. Chips won't because the pieces are too friable and they, and they, they fall. So nothing can dig in. And then we... We were very meticulous about keeping about a, a 10 inch fringe around the edge so so it doesn't go clear to the edge. So, so you, you keep it a little bit saucer shaped as you build it, you know, so it's layered. You, know, you start and you add another layer, another layer, another layer. But all the layers are saucer shaped with a 12 inch fringe so none of the sloppy guts and blood and all that stuff can, can get out to the fringes, which, which again, creates a, a DMZ, a demilitarized zone for vermin to, they, they can't come up to it and see a, a little intestine hanging out to get a hold of and pull. There's, you know, there's this space. And then we have, we have uh, uh, walls, not solid walls, but, you know, uh, containment fences. You use cattle paddles, pig panels, uh, boards, but, but some sort of containment so the so the walls so the edges are sheer um, because this stuff is really sloppy and goopy and you don't want a blowout you know as you build this up you don't want you don't want a blowout of having it uh, come out to the edge and then it, and then it heats up and the heat keeps everything away um, so we've never had any problem with vermin uh, uh, getting into the piles and. Uh, and they work work very well, and of course they're always a favorite of uh, when I do school tours. You, know, you got a bunch of a bunch of kids, especially like you know, ten year old, twelve year old boys, you know, and they're they always got their stick and they're poking around the edges and they find a you know a skull or a cow pelvis, you know, something and they become like you know He Man, Congo to Samson, <laughs> you, know, you know, jawbone of a cow, you know, something like yeah. that. Yeah, and uh, I always want to. <laughs> Get a one of these uh, from one of these biology labs. Uh, you know, a plastic, a plastic human skull. You know, like they use in biology class. Put it right in the edge. You know, and uh, these kids are poking around the edge. You know, and a skull rolls out. <gasps> oh, that was that bureaucrat that came last week. You know. That's too funny. <laughs> That's way too funny. <laughs> Yeah, I'm ready to start wherever you guys are. Okay. Hey, welcome everybody. Um, I don't know if you know who's teaching this class today. I'm pretty sure you've never met the guy, but anyway, we're, we're thrilled to have you here, Joel. And I can't think of anybody who would do a better demo on processing a chicken than Joel Salatin. And I'm just honored that he was willing to stay overnight and stay this morning. So how the day is going to go is we're going to start with an introduction to chicken processing. And then Joel's going to talk us through how you process a chicken. Then he's going to show us where you have to make sure the scald water is at the temperature before we do that because we don't want to show you a chicken that's hard to pluck. That wouldn't be any fun at all. And then Chef Brett Corrieri, come here. He and I will walk you through hands-on processing of a chicken. 
and then whoever wants to take one home until they're gone can take one home so we'll go through that process we have lunch vouchers for the restaurant out there at Big Daddy's so we can break for lunch anytime usually how it goes is we get through all the morning stuff we get through processing the chickens and having them on ice to chill go to lunch and then come back and package them sometimes we're super fast and we get everything done, go to lunch and leave. I'll make space for Q&A after we've gotten all the chickens done so you can continue to ask questions. I'm happy to talk about what it costs, you know, like prices involved on raising them different ways. And then we are really lucky to have the farmers here who raise the chickens. So Emily, do you want to come up? So this is Emily from Hoff Grid Homestead who saved me from having to raise 25 chickens for this class in addition to doing self Reliance Festival. Thank you so oh, much. Awesome. Tell us about your farm. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I'm Emily. My husband is Adam over here. Uh, we are Hoff the Grid Homestead. So uh, I was excited to come to the festival and learn some new things that I didn't know as well because we do try to uh, have some self-reliant aspects of our, our core family unit. And then we also raise chicken and um, attend farmers markets around in Dixon, McEwen. We're from McEwen, I don't, I don't think I said that, which is 30 minutes eastward on 70. Um, this is also very full circle for us because we watched Joel learn how to process chickens on YouTube, Joel and David Schaefer. 2019 uh, Homestead of America's Festival, I think is what it was we were watching. So we know how to process chickens because of Joel. And so now we're here with chickens for Joel to show you how to process. So very full circle, so I'm super appreciative. Um, and we're really, really excited to be here. So one of the reasons we were able to do this class is because you bought tickets, but it's also because Featherman sponsored us. When I reached out to Featherman and said, hey, I'm, I'm doing this class that's hands-on. We want to highlight your equipment. Joel Salatin will be here. Would you sponsor? They were all in, and then they realized I had double booked with Homesteaders of America. And I got this message saying, we can't be there with our equipment. And I said, well, will you sponsor anyway? Because I already have your equipment, and I can highlight your equipment. So we will be using their plucker today and the scalder over in the pole barn. You are welcome to help yourself to coffee throughout the day that's out under the tent. And let's see, what else? So after this class, I'd appreciate it if you would thank Featherman for making this possible. And in your guide, so I have a... a this is my book, Don't Be a Chicken, A Guide to Fowl Processing booklet. And the sponsor logos are in there, so Fetterman's in there to remind you. I recommend picking these up after the class so they don't get messy, but they'll be up here. You can grab one on your way out. And with that, I'm gonna ask Joel Salatin to come up and, and kick us off. Great, well, it's good to have you on this frigid southern morning. This is why we don't put your chickens in the winter. Uh, because we are open air, just like we're going to be today. We're open air. Now we do have some plastic sheets we can put out if it's breezy, you know, kind of cut some wind, but we're open air. So we normally uh, process our last bird, uh, you know, certainly before the end of October, around October 15th, 20th. So we're right at the time when we would uh, finish it. It's not so bad on the front end, but the QC is where it gets cold because you're cold water, cold chickens, and when you have, and you, when you have cold hands and cold day, it's tough. But the, the guys are killing and scalding and, and, and gutting. You're putting your hands in the warm chicken. That, that, that's all okay if it's cold, but, but boy, it's on the QC end that, uh, that it gets a little bit tight. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk just a little bit about, about uh, chickens. Um, one of the reasons how many of you have ever butchered chickens? All right, so about half of you. How many of you haven't ever butchered a chicken? Okay, so we got about half and half. All right. Um, so the reason that I'm bullish on chickens is uh, as, not only to feed yourself, but also as a starting business is because, A, um, everybody eats chicken. I mean, except vegans stuff but 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 th there's no you know taboos there's no religious taboos uh, about chicken so uh, American consumption of chicken right now is about 72 pounds per person per year okay that's a lot of chicken 
and uh, and chicken the industry is by far and away the most abusive of animals uh, way more than cows I mean even even uh, feedlock feedlot cows uh, still spend their most of their their calf hood on mama out in the field you know uh, chickens don't even ha don't have a luxury of anything they come right into a factory farm and so the uh, and that's why the poultry industry suffers the greatest number of, you know, high path avian influenza, salmonella outbreaks, all that, because it is the most despicable of the three major breeds, beef, pork, chicken. Uh, beef is, uh, I'm sorry, chicken is the most, whatever, obscene uh, in the production phase, which, which makes it the target of people who care about stewardship, care about animals, care about life, and so it makes it easier, it's the easiest, it's the easiest um, um, animal to message a differentiation if you have them in a different setting. And you can contrast it really, really easy uh, and more aggressively than any other, any other thing. And I would suggest uh, it's also the easiest to um, the easiest to get into grass-fed, grass-finished beef is the finest wine of the animal protein. It ain't easy to have decent grass-finished beef. That's that's a real art and a real craft. Chicken, you know, you get your you get your feed, you pump it to the chicken, and boom, you know, they just they just grow. Um, they because a chicken even at best will only eat 12 to 15 percent of its diet off the pasture at best so pasture chicken does not actually save feed costs but that 12 to 15 percent of grass bugs worms things that's a that's like a, a, a tonic it's a supplement it's a all right and as you know uh, it doesn't take much of a supplement if it's potent to make a big difference you know think of how many tiny grams of something you can do to whatever go into a psychedelic crazy okay uh, you know, how much fentanyl does it take you know, right so so uh, uh, supplements uh, can be really powerful and so that's what the that's what the pastor does <clears throat> um, chickens layers need to be culled and so even if you don't want to raise chickens for meat and all you want is eggs, they're not going to lay forever. And, you know, on a commercial scale, normally two years is maximum. Um, sometimes you can press it, press it to three. But generally, two years, you're going to be wanting to get rid of it because you don't want to be feeding chickens that aren't laying. So their laying is going to drop, 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 you know, throughout. So even if you're just wanting to do eggs, this is still valuable because you want to be able to cull your chickens and not just throw them away. And uh, and of course the old standard stewing hen is a, is still a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. If you've never had one, there's nothing like an old stewing hen. The fat's orange, uh, the taste is unbelievable, and uh, you know if you want to if you want to really make some decent casserole, stewing hen is great. We our favorite for stewing hens we we you know, we dress them. And then we, I put as many as I can in a great big roaster pan, the biggest thing we've got. You can usually get about seven or eight in there. 350 for four hours. The meat falls off the bone. Debone them. Put it in quart containers in the freezer where you can can it. Um, and then you've got pre-cooked, ready-to-go chicken. And that's, that's our favorite convenience food. Okay? Um, so, you know... <clears throat> We, we pride ourselves, of course, in scratch cooking, but there are days when you want something quick. Oh, you know, uh, we just didn't get around and it's five o'clock, what's for supper? And boy, if you've got a, a bunch of quarts of, of, of uh, canned, picked off, pre-cooked chicken, you can have uh, chicken a la king in about 30 minutes, right? And have a gourmet dinner uh, in just a few minutes. So, so that's kind of our go-to deal. The other thing is that they work so well with everything else. 
from a permaculture stacking standpoint. There's not an orchard, there's not a wheat field, there's not a pasture in the world that doesn't benefit from pasture poultry. We, we, we talk all the time in the pasture, in the grass movement about, you know, cows, moving cows around all this stuff and the, and the, the bison and all that stuff. But people don't talk about the flocks of birds. Audubon sat under a tree in about 1820 and he recorded in his diary in Massachusetts, he said, I was sitting under a tree and uh, I couldn't see the sun for three days because a flock of passenger pigeons flew over and it was so big it blocked out the sun for three days. In Indian lore, Native American lore, has stories of, of villages where passenger pigeons would come in and, and roost in the trees and when they all woke up the next morning all they had were spires of trees where all the branches had broken off. There was an inch of poop on the ground and all the branches were broken off where the birds had, had, had roosted so heavy on the tree branches they broke all the branches off. You know, we, we, don't, we don't think today, we don't think about that volume, that kind of bird activity in pre-European America. But that's, that's a fact, that's, that's what was here. Long before Tyson, you know, long before uh, factory houses, uh, there were birds, lots and lots of birds. So to complement the herbivore, the bison, were these birds. And so we think from a, from a whole farm ecosystem, uh, the fact that we, that we balance our cows with birds, chickens are birds, um, uh, creates a, a balanced, you know, more symbiotic relational ecosystem like was here with the bison and the passenger pigeons and prairie chickens and all these other birds. So we add, we add the scratch and peck to the hoof print. Right? Those, those are, are symbiotic and go together. <coughs> the nice thing about chickens is, so if you're, if you're raising them for meat, so <coughs> for, for eggs, the nice thing about chickens is they are the ultimate, I think, the ultimate um, home-centric animal protein. Uh, they eat anything. In fact, they would eat you, you know, if you went in and lay down in the pen with them for long enough. Um, they'll eat anything so they can, they're the ultimate uh, upcycler of all your kitchen scraps. Uh, anytime you're, you know, peeling apples or, you know, grapes, you've got pumice from pressing grapes. I mean, all the, all the food scraps and waste that you have uh, can go through a chicken and they give you wonderful eggs as a result. So they're the most utility critter and I would suggest they're the most child friendly because they're not very big. I mean, even a even a, a ram, sheep, can run over a three-year-old. But there's not a chicken that's going to run over a three-year-old. I mean, they might scare you, okay? But they're not. They're not. They're not you're not going to have your child, child go to the hospital, you know, um, uh, with with a chicken. So they're very, very child-friendly, which makes them very family-friendly that way. They're the ultimate recycler. And, uh, and, and they don't take much infrastructure. You're not, you're not dealing with corrals. And even if a chicken gets on the road and somebody hits it, uh, you're not going to get sued by you know, killing somebody on the road because they ran over a chicken. Okay? Whereas a cow, uh, you, know, you, can, you can cause some damage if a cow gets out. So the infrastructure is real light and gentle. Um, of course, the negative about chickens is everybody, everything out there that goes bump in the night at 2 o'clock likes chicken too. And, uh, and so, and, and, they, and they don't fight, you know, at night they just go to sleep and anything in the world can come up and, and grab them. So, um, so we just want to keep that in mind. One of the beauties of the meat chicken, that one of the reasons I like the meat chicken is because the, turn, the cash turnaround is so fast. Uh, you know, they, you know, it's, it's eight weeks. You buy the chick, you raise it eight weeks, you butcher it, I mean, eight weeks is, fa is as fast as a radish, you know, I mean, from a, from a cash flow standpoint, it's a real rapid turnaround, whereas beef, you know, you're looking at two, three years, you know, breed the cow, have the calf, raise the calf, slaughter the calf, you know, it, it's, it's a two, three year process, whereas chicken, eight weeks, you, know, you got your money back. So you can actually 
you can actually start a business and cash flow it in two months, and and you're you know you're up and running. So our benchmarks on our farm, we raise. So if you take all of the uh, area that we cover with a, with the meat chickens, the broilers, um, it comes out to about 600 chickens per acre. Okay. Our average sale price is twenty dollars a chicken. That's twelve thousand dollars an acre, and we margin that out at about at least thirty percent, thirty-five percent. So you're looking at a margin, an enterprise margin of thirty-five hundred to four thousand dollars an acre. Okay, and remember, we can run eggmobiles across that, turkeys, cows, sheep. Okay, uh, we can make hay on that acreage. And so when you when you start adding those together, you can look at you know twenty five thousand dollars an acre. When you start looking at that, suddenly this small scale farming becomes viable. Okay. And uh, and so there's there's a lot to say about about the chicken. All right, let let's move into the processing. So. Um, So as we come to today, we want those birds to come fasting. This is one of, the, one of the critical components. We want the bird to come fasting. Why? Because we want that digestive system to be as cleaned out as possible. We want the crop to be empty. We want everything, all the digestive system to be as clean as possible. Because it makes the processing much easier. So we want a bird to be feed free, pull the feed away, somewhere around 18 hours. So the birds we processed this morning, I hope haven't had feed since noon yesterday. Okay? What? 1130. 1130. From yesterday. Yeah. Right on. Perfect. <laughs> Alright, these guys, I'll just let them teach you class. I don't even know. Alright. So you want them to come fasting. Um, and and the thing of, and it's fine to actually crate them up the night before if you're going to start early morning processing you can crate them up the night before that's fine um, you don't want to crate them 24 hours before maybe so they get, they get thirsty but uh, the thing about the crates is if you're familiar at all with the work of Temple Grandin and the uh, and the you know the the hug Okay, uh, the, the, the chickens, when they get in that crate, it's actually not stressful to them because they're confined tightly and they can't get up and run around and so they just kind of quietly sit there. And so don't think that the crate is, uh, is uh, uh, stressful for them. It's a lot less stressful than putting a hundred of them in a pickup bed or a, or a cattle trailer, because when you get done, uh, you're going to have ten of them suffocated in the corner where they piled up. The beauty of the crate is that there's no that, that there's no place to go, and there's no um, mass. There's no mass of birds that can pile up and suffocate the others if they you know if they get scared or whatever. So. Uh, that's why the industry uses crates, because uh, it is very safe and very stress-free on the birds. Any questions here? This is not a, this is a very interactive, uh, intimate thing, and so I want to really keep it open. Yes? How many uh, chickens in a crate? How many chickens in a crate? All depends on how big they are. So if they, so uh, normally the, the, the dress out on a chicken will be about 78% of its live weight, okay? About 78%. So if a chicken weighs um, six pounds live, it's going to dress out about four and three quarter pounds, okay? If, uh, if the chickens are, you know, uh, if they're averaging six pounds, we put eight in a crate. And if they're averaging a little under six, we can put a ten in the crate. Okay. 
Okay? So it's all it's all about the size. Big chickens versus little chickens. So um, let's let's talk just a little bit about breed. I think these are Cornish cross. Yeah. So a lot of people excoriate me for using Cornish cross. Oh, you should use, you know, heritage breeds and something like that. Well, my mentor, Alan Nation, who I introduced you to yesterday, uh, he always said in marketing, you can be a nudist or you can be a Buddhist. But if you're a nudist Buddhist, it's just too weird. They won't believe you. <laughs> and so, and so uh, I'm not opposed to exotics, to, you know, heritage breeds. But here we are trying to market chickens into a marketplace that even your best customers are used to a nice big double breast. So if we go to them and say, not only do I not want you to buy your chickens at Walmart, I want you to buy them from us, and they're not going to be pre-bred and have a pop-up thermometer inside them, and um, and they're going to be all dark meat. Who wants that white meat? Nah, you don't want that white meat. Just, just dark meat. And the breast, breast or razor breast. And they're 16 weeks old instead of eight. So you can't fry them. You can't fat. You got to, you got to uh, crock pot them or you know, um, broil them, slow cook them. And you know, and you start down that path, and you suddenly become a nudist Buddhist. All right. And so we make no apologies for the fact that. We believe that we have presented to the, for the world a credible alternative to the entire factory farming system. A credible alternative. Okay. So, once we shut down Purdue and Tyson and Pilgrim's Pride and Sanderson Farms and all the great big factory farms, once we shut that down, then the next permutation can be, well, we can we can start niching our niche, you know, and go to some exotics and things. Um, we actually, right now that we're, we've been uh, hatching our own chicks now for about nine years, next year will be year 10, and we're just at the point, now don't, don't hold me to this, but we are at the point now this winter where we're talking about selling hatching eggs. We can ship them through the mail so you can hatch your own birds from birds that are 10 years on GMO-free pasture genetics. We didn't do this to sell chickens. We did this because we got less and less happy with the birds we were Now, this is for layer, not, not meat birds, layer. Uh, we got less and less happy with the birds we were getting from the hatchery. And uh, so about nine years ago, uh, we began uh, hatching, breeding our own, hatching our own and we were hooked on day one. Those birds were smarter. If you've ever seen the size of a chicken brain, you know they need all the help they can get. Um, they were smarter, so they trained faster. They trained to the eggmobile. They trained, I mean, they just were way smarter. Because uh, remember, our criteria for selection is, are you old, are you healthy, and are you productive? We don't care how big you are. We don't care how, what color you are. We don't care if you got feathers on your legs. Uh, you know, uh, all we care, are you old, healthy, and productive? So, these are the two-year-old birds that for a long time have not looked into the sky and seen the hawk and said, hi, feathered cousin, uh, uh, would you like to come down and we'll have dinner together and I'll be the entree. Uh, no, these are the birds that saw the hawk and ran under the eggmobile, under the feather net, and, 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 and so, so every, every generation, every generation carries adaptive memory genetically. We call this nativizing genetics. That's why uh, Eskimos um, can handle more cold and Floridians uh, can't, okay? Over time, you, uh, you know, progeny develops um, genetic memory. And so uh, our birds have been on pasture. They've been in you know our system, and so uh, and and they've they've eluded the predators for a long, long time. And so that's genetic memory in the system. They're more docile, okay? and we need docile birds. We don't candle our eggs. 
remember we're you know we're getting 200 dozen eggs a day okay so this is not a backyard operation and we don't candle them even though we sell into commercial establishments into markets um, and ship nationwide we don't candle them and so we don't want them full of mets meat spots blood spots and and, and stress indicators so uh, that docility is really a, a, a critical component for us. And in other words, we don't want a flock of chickens when you walk into them, go, you know, we want the chickens to, you know, to, to want us to come in with them. And, um, and they're bigger, they're bigger body. And so, uh, so keep your eyes open. We'll, you know, when we get ready to, we, we, we sold some this year, kind of a soft little trial and um, and all the feedback we got from the folks who bought those hatching eggs, you know, and had a little, you know, uh, incubators they could hatch them themselves, um, ran uh, over 85%, several of them ran over 90% hatch, which is unheard of in the industry. If you, in the industry, if you get 80% or more, you know, you're in good shape. Well, you have them for pickup, too? You mean the eggs? Yeah. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what we did this year. We didn't ship any this year. We had people at the farm, and they, you know, we let them, we let them buy the, the, uh, the, those eggs. So you have roosters out with your laying eggs, yes. or this is a special group? This is, this is a, we've selected the females and the males, and they're in a special group. We don't have cockerels with the other flocks. So we've got, you know, four flocks of a thousand, and only one uh, has uh, roosters with it at one to ten, and that that uh, is enough to keep the hatch up. Um, and so this year, I think we hatched I don't know what six or seven thousand. But the problem is the cockerels. That's the problem with hatching your own at cockerels. And so what what has held us back from offering anything is is um, is the cockerels. So our cockerels have become our heritage birds. Okay, the cockerels for our layers. Uh, we 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 call them we call them a, you know heritage genetics because they are, and um, so that gives us a that gives us that offering for really uh, gourmand customers um, that that want them. And you know we don't sell very many. We sell I don't even sell we sell a thousand a year, um, but. It, do, it does give us that option. So we have the freezer. We have, you know, the heritage, the heritage cockerel, uh, and then we have, you know, the regular uh, double-breasted, double-breasted uh, Cornish cross bird. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what's your operating cost per acre? Operating cost per acre. Well, we don't keep an operating cost per acre. We keep an operating cost per chicken. Okay. So you you so you have a margin per chicken. And then you multiply that by how many birds you have an acre, and, and it all it all comes out. Okay, so. Um, um, yeah, maybe. Uh, maybe yeah, maybe we could. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's black. I can wash it. Don't have an eraser. Okay. Uh, well, it, it right. got it got missing. This that's weekend. fine. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, I got bounced off. That All right. Works. All right. So. Yeah. You got the chick. Dollar twenty. Feed. All right. Uh, we use GMO free uh, feed, locally grown. Uh, runs about thirty cents a pound. Um, they're going to eat 14 pounds of bird, so that's 420. Okay. Then we have labor, and I don't I don't have time this morning to. to so labor is divided into two parts. You've got production, and you've got process. Okay. Interestingly, those two numbers are about the same. So it takes as much labor on the processing as it does all the daily moves of cumulative labor up until processing day, all right? So both of these, and, and we're assuming here uh, $25 to $30 an hour, which is good pay for farming, okay? Uh, 
this is this is 150 and this is two okay a little more into processing than, than the uh, production and processing includes you know if you cut them up and packaging and, and all, all the labor involved in, in processing all right ice so we buy our ice we don't make our ice we have extremely calcitic water and anytime we do you know heat exchangers and stuff uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, calcium problems and so we buy ice wholesale so we pay the same amount for ice as Walmart does when they fill their ice bins uh, and they love us we buy them by the pallet load the truck just comes right there front and loader off the truck it's real cheap um, and I, we've looked and looked and looked for years at you know ice making machines and the the cost of maintenance all it takes is one three thousand dollar maintenance bill and you can about buy all the ice you need for the season you know so so it just doesn't pay so our ice cost is um, is about 30 cents per bird okay and then you've got packaging so you've got you know you've got whatever packaging a plastic bag uh, you know whatever you're going to use there for, for packaging um, runs 20 and then we've got um, propane okay propane both for the brooding so we use uh, propane hovers in the uh, in the brooder house and we do have we do have an outdoor wood furnace a Taylor water stove, outdoor wood furnace, so we heat our house, mom's house, or hot water uh, with wood, and we have it plumbed so we can run a heat exchanger to the brooder house if we ever needed to. Um, but for us, uh, since our electricity comes from the grid, um, we like the brooder to be. Um, completely off grid, which the propane tank allows us allows us to do. So there's no electricity needed for the brooder. So the, if the power goes out, our outdoor wood stove doesn't work because the the fan and the circulating pumps don't work. So at least the chicks won't die. <laughs> we we can put on we can put on a bunch of uh, you know clothes or start a fire in the fireplace, uh, but the, the chicks won't die. So uh, propane on average runs and, and that includes propane for heating the scald water all that uh, runs uh, about 20 okay then you have depreciation okay on all the shelters the infrastructure all that uh, again I can give you the working papers on this in other words you, you take you take a shelter and you build it for four hundred dollars do you have these the book you've written <laughs> um, I think they're in uh, Pastor Poultry Province. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure they're in there. The, 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 they, they might not be current right here to today. But yeah, but the basic list is there. Okay. Uh, and, and you can do this for yourself. Okay. I mean, once and you, once you can order those directly from this website. You yeah. Just throw that one out there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you, you take a. You, how do you figure this? Okay. I, I'm amazed all the time at how people are just seem to be lost at figuring out margin. All right. So, so this is a this is a good one. So imagine we've got a shelter that costs four hundred dollars. Okay. We can that life shelf that life span on that shelter is twenty years. It's going to raise three hundred birds per year. Okay. So that's six thousand birds. Okay, and we're going to divide that by 400. Everybody with me? And it comes out. Um, who's got a quick calculator there? Six thousand or 400 divided by six thousand is going to be like 15, 16 cents. What is it? Seven cents. Seven cents. Yeah. All right. So we'll put 10 cents on here. It's always good to figure a little bit high and low, um, but the, the, the biggest the biggest um, lie we give ourselves in business is failure to capture all the costs. And we're sitting here, we're working ourselves to death. Why? Why can't I get ahead? Why can't I get ahead? Why can't? 
and well, it's because we've got these hidden these hidden things in there that we're not you know that we're not um, we're not capturing, and and we don't we don't realize. It. 